Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Broad Eye podcast. I'm Dr. Bruno Fernandez, and today I had the pleasure of having Professor Emeritus John Kennedy from the University of Toronto. How's it going, Professor Kennedy? It's a pleasure having you on the podcast today. No, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for asking me, Bruno. All right. Uh, mind if I call you John? Please do. All right, you'll be easier. So you're a psychologist and you've practiced like all over the world. So like, why don't you walk us through your professional life, your training, your background, and how did you end up in Canada? Well, I'm originally from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I went to Queen's University, Belfast as a psychology student. And uh, in my second year, I uh, started reading things by famous Canadian psychologist, Donald Hebb. And he argued that uh, the basis of perception was a uh, figure and ground. He said that, you know, once you got the basis there, you could work things out from there and understand and develop a good theory of perception. So, and perception seemed to me a, a crucial part of our understanding of the world. It's how we connect to the world. How, how does it work? And is it accurate? Is it uh, full of problems? Are, are there new things we can do in perception that nobody's ever done ever before? Can we make new kinds of movies and television things? And can we um, create virtual realities in new ways? These are the kinds of questions that uh, per study of perception leads you to. And so I was excited by this study and I went to Cornell University to work with a guy called James J. Gibson. And he is in many ways, the great genius of perception of the 20th century. Uh, he overturned many, many ideas. He revolutionized the study of vision. And uh, I studied with him and I remember one time he walked into a classroom where I was teaching. Uh, I was a teaching assistant and I did a few demonstrations for him and explained things and uh, for him and the class. And he turned to the class and he said, this man will rewrite a page in the history of psychology. <laughs> That's a, lo a lot of pressure there. <laughs> it was a, a great thing, a very memorable, wonderful guy. And uh, so I went after working with James Gibson, I went to Harvard, I taught there for a couple of years. Uh, the thesis that I worked out with uh, James Gibson was about pictures and perception. What's the basis of pictures? What is it that the cave artists discovered when they invented picture making? And when I was at Harvard, I was working on that and child development. And I started working with bl the blind blind adults and um, adults who were blind. And I started asking them to try to identify pictures that I made with raised lines. I mean, simple pictures of a hand, a fork, a flag, a, a man's face, a table, things like that. And lo and behold, these blind people uh, said, oh yeah, I can identify some of these. And they did. I, I made them a bit small. It was actually quite difficult. Um, I was only making them about, you know, palm size, the size of your palm of your hand. When I started making them much bigger, sort of eight and a half by 11, A4 sized, you might say, in Europe, uh, then um, people identified sort of 80% of them, often with a little hint or whatever. So and these were people often who said, I've been born blind and I've never had pictures in my life before. And that I took off from that. I tried to develop a really good theory of perception that would make predictions about what the sighted and the blind uh, can do. And also what it was that cave artists discovered and what happened in the middle of the uh, 14th century, uh, 1400s, when, when people exploited perspective, they discovered the sequence of linear perspective, the geometry, about 1413. What happened in the 19th century for picture making? When people started making those little devices for showing movement. And what, what, how can we revolutionize things further in the 20th century? And I'm, I'm really interested in the many uses of pictures 
and in particular, um, the wonderful things that we can do with uh, pictures that convey all sorts of meanings. So I left Harvard, came to Toronto, and started richly exploring things to do with pictures. I've had wonderful students from all over the world come and work with me, and we are still discovering new things, new uses of pictures, new understandings, new ways in which we've discovered uh, children sighted and blind or novices drawing, uh, how they draw at first and how they will draw later. Uh, my colleagues in places like Nepal, in India and in Poland and in Taiwan are also following this up and the discoveries are coming thick and fast. All right, so I already have a ton of questions here, so let's rewind a bit, like, and then, like, when you were at Harvard, you said, like, you, you did some experiments, like, with uh, some drawings with raised lines, and then you were showing that, like, to people that were blind, that were able to identify that. So raised lines, I mean, sorry if the question is too basic, but is it, it's like, basically, a, like, a drawing that someone could pass their fingers over and, and, and sort of feel the, where the lines were? Good question. What has happened in the last few decades is that people have invented simple raised line drawing kits. Here's how they work. You have a plastic sheet. It's a little textured. It's thin. You put it on something like a mouse pad that's slightly giving to pressure. And then you take an ordinary ballpoint pen. You could use a pencil too. Uh, you run the ballpoint pen over the surface, the plastic surface, it's resting on the pad. And you use a little pressure. And what happens is the, the paper, the plastic sheet uh, crinkles and it makes a line that is raised, a thin line that is raised. So when you touch it from above, you put the pressure down, but the line actually comes up. It's a bit like a, a tiny series of mountains up and down and up and down and up and down. And you can feel the bumps as you run your hand along the plastic sheet. So you can make drawings like that and give them to people who are blind and ask them to identify them. And you can ask novices uh, or practiced people, uh, children or adults, to take up thy pen, the raised line drawing pen, the ballpoint pen, and make a drawing. And they, many people will say, I've never done this before. Oh, I, I can do this. So blind people who say, I've never drawn in my life before. When I ask them to make a raised line drawing, they can do it. And they say, oh, that's a surprise. I didn't know I could do that. Some of them say, you know, whenever I was in school, I wanted to make pictures. And people told me, my teachers told me, you can't do that because you're blind. And I'm not sure what they were thinking. Maybe the teachers were thinking, you know, if you put watercolors on a page, you won't be able to feel that. So that would be just frustrating. Uh, but actually, you ask a blind person to make a drawing and something like, you know, a cup, a hand, a fork. They can do it. I've had blind people draw for one, uh, one wonderful woman in New York, draw a horse. And she drew the horse better than I could draw a horse. I said, I did how come? What, what's going on? And she said, I like drawing. My parents have encouraged me. And, you know, I have a little model horse and I've tried to draw him. And my first drawing wasn't any good. So I made another drawing and that one wasn't much better. So I did it again. I did it several times until I felt satisfied with my horse. And, you know, the back legs of a horse have a very special shape. I, I can see it, but I can't draw it. You know, I haven't practiced it. If I try to draw a horse, it ends up looking like the horse is wearing pajamas. It's just a wriggly thing that comes down from the body. She drew the shape, you know, capturing the key features. You know, I was deeply impressed by that. 
so how does the process goes because like they they mean they didn't in order to draw like they need to touch right like i mean of course assuming that those are people they've never seen before so like they they touch a cup and then they draw the cup or they touch a horse and then they they draw the horse right like i mean they need to to, to touch the object before they write is that true pretty much yes you could of course describe some um random shape some shape that they've never seen you could say oh it's got a, a thin trunk and then it branches to the left and then there's a great big globe attached to the little branch to the left but there's another branch to the right and when you go there there's a cube attached to that can you draw this um, abstract random object and they could say sure or they could say i will draw uh, something that i've never felt and it's an imaginary object uh, a, a monster and they could do that there's a guy eshref in ankara he likes to draw monsters uh, he paints them actually and uh, you know it's a, a monster coming out of the sea so he imagines things about claws and teeth and uh, horrible big heads and a tail and then he draws it blind people can imagine things and draw them just like sighted people yeah and when i when i i heard that like so when we see like drawings made by kids and then it, it, there is often like they they highlight that specific parts so like big eyes or big ears and I, i i heard that that's what draws their attention the most like so that is reflected on the way they draw like it's so whatever draws their attention more becomes like disproportionately large on on their drawings uh is there something similar when when blind people draw like I mean, it, it tends to be not exactly proportional because when they touch something like something draws their attention more and then as a consequence that the drawings might not seem like perfectly proportional well you're you're asking a very general question there i think uh, so behind your question is is this uh sighted people uh practice drawing and get sort of better at it and what they're drawing at first has a childlike quality and there seems to be a kind of drawing development sequence that uh sighted people go through when they first draw they draw in one way when they're drawing a few years later they draw another way and so on and is there a similar sequence for the blind who are starting off as novices even as adults as novices and the answer to that is yes and I'll give you a an a, a really nice example if you were to draw an apple with a pin stuck all the way through it well we've known since about 1895 that when sighted kids start drawing when they try to draw the apple with a pin through it they don't draw it with a, a stick coming up to the apple and then a circle for the apple and then another stick coming out of the apple and leave the middle part of the pin um uh, obscured by the apple and not drawn no they draw the pin all the way through the apple because it's inside and so inside the circle can mean inside the apple ah oh, let's try that with blind people so we've asked a blind no, uh, novice in italy an adult to draw an apple with a pin through it and sure enough he made the pin go all the way through the apple and we thought okay so inside the circle means it's inside the apple well, how would he draw a head then because we could ask him to draw the eyes when he drew a head he made a circle for the head and where did he put the eyes did he put them in the middle of the circle no he put them on the line on the circumference because your eyes are on the surface of your head now we could ask him then and we did to draw uh, a a soccer ball so if you put anything inside the circle for the soccer ball it means it's inside in the space inside in the air inside the soccer ball so how can you draw the panels for the soccer ball 
because they're all over the surface. And the answer is that this chap, we'll call him Albe. It's not his right name. Let's just call him Albe. He drew a circle and then he drew a whole lot of little circles on the big circle because they're the panels and on the line means on the surface of the soccer ball. So sighted kids do that. Blind novices drawing, they do that. If you ask a, a, a sighted child of about seven or eight to draw a cube, they will often draw the cube as though it's folded out. That is, they draw a sort of square, and then attached to the square, they put little wings, other squares. And above the main central square, they draw another square attached to that uh, main square, and maybe even another square below that square. So you get five squares all attached because it is folded out. The idea is mm. it's folded out. Uh, sighted kids do that. If you ask blind adults who are novices at drawing to draw a cube, they will also often draw the cube as though folded out. Now, sighted kids take years to move from one um, system of drawing to another. It may take two or three years to move from the inside theory of how to draw um, the pin in, in the apple and then the, the uh, fold out, maybe that's a little later, two years later or so, and then drawing with a little bit of perspective is maybe two years later. And you will often find Blind adults, when they are drawing, they run through some of these uh, stages of drawing within matters of minutes or hours. Oh, I could draw it this way. Oh, I'm not happy with that. You know what I could do? And then they draw it in a more sophisticated way. And then they say, yeah, yeah, but that's got problems. Uh, you know what? And then they draw it in a more sophisticated way. So blind adults run through the drawing developmental sequence in the right order relatively rapidly compared to sighted kids. So for, for line drawings, like you, you have those kits, right? So they can use their, their, their fingers like, I mean, to, to have some sort of like feedback on what they did. Uh, like what it's even more impressive for me, it's in the case of color. Like, cause I've seen some, some paintings done by uh, uh, visually impaired that are remarkably detailed on like the, the shades of a particular color, color and how uh, harmonious it is, you know, like uh, on how they, they blend those colors together. And how does it work? I, I guess they, they would need someone to label and tell them what color are they working with? Or is there any way that they can do that by themselves? Right. It's a great question because indeed there are some very impressive colored pictures by people who are blind, adults in particular. Uh, there's Eshref, for example, in Ankara. There's a guy in Texas too, draw, paints very well. If you have been totally blind from birth, you will have heard in your life a lot of things about color. So it's hearsay, you might say. You may, uh, like Eshref, often have asked a lot of questions about color. What color is the grass? What color are shadows? So in, uh, in first drawing, the shadows of objects, Eshref thought, hmm, if the object is green like a tree, maybe the shadow should be green too. And then people talked to him and said, actually, what's happening with the shadows is the light is being cut out. And so what's on the ground is just dark. Oh, he said, all right, I get it. So where things should be shaded, he makes them darker. Uh, that is, this is from instruction and from hearsay and from understanding. That is, he understands a lot about Oh, light comes from a certain direction. Light falls in a certain way. I mean, a lot of that is actually intuitive and easy to understand. You know, you face a certain way, you get the sunlight. You face the opposite way, oh, the sunlight is now on my back. Okay, I'm, I'm standing by this building. I'm in full sunlight. 
If I walk around this corner, oh, the sunlight has disappeared, the heat is gone. Uh, you can get a lot of those senses of brightness and darkness as uh, heat and, and, and cool. Um, you can do a lot of that by feel, but uh, if you want to know about all the differences about color, you know, what color is grass? What color is the tulip? What color is the snowdrop? You have to ask questions. And then if you want to paint them, like Eschref does, what he does in his case is he always arranges his colors in a certain order on his palette or his pad. And then he can dab his finger into black or white. And he can dab his finger into red or orange or yellow or green or indigo or violet. They can be arranged in a fixed order. And then he can control the order in which he puts the paints on the canvas. Um, there are wonderful YouTubes of him painting uh, with his fingers. He dabs his fingers into the paint. He puts it on the surface. And he has a remarkably astute sense of what he's just done and where it is on the actual uh, square page. So he can quickly and efficiently fill in a picture, know where they start parts that are still in need of some paint and then choose the right paint and put paint there. And he can know when he's filled the canvas with his paints. Um, he has a remarkably good, clear sense of the two dimensional surface and what's been filled in there. Now, you also are questioning things about three dimensions when you make a picture. And there are really interesting studies showing that blind people have a very good sense of the distance and directions of objects around them. I wonder if I should, you know, at least tell you one of those studies that we've done that we've learned a lot from. I think that would be a good a transition to my next question, you know, like, I mean, so what can we learn from them, right? Because usually people that are, that, that have a challenge, like they, they are creative on figuring things out and you know, like on how to do things their way. And it often provides like, I mean, useful, useful insight for, for everyone else. Like, I mean, not only people with, uh, with a handicap. So like, what have we learned like from, from them and what, that can be applied that can be for fully sighted people when they draw or paint. One of the fascinating things that's innovative and creative uh, in what I've seen in drawings by blind people is when they solve problems in drawing that would challenge any sighted person. I'll give you a simple example from um, a girl of about 12 from Taiwan. She was asked to draw a car going down the street. She was asked to draw a car stopped. And she was asked to show a car with its brakes on. Now, any sighted person would say, what, what do I do to make the car look as though it's moving? What, what do I do to make the car seem as though it's stopped? What can I do to suggest that its brakes are on? And you know, it's just a static image that I'm drawing. How do I do each of those things? How do I discriminate and distinguish the three? So what the girl did is really very effective. When the car was drawn going down the street, she drew it elongated. And she drew one end larger than the other to suggest, well, that's the front. And when it, she drew the car static and stopped, the car was now shrunk shrunk and the two ends of the car were similar sizes. And when she drew the car with its brakes on, she did something with the wheels. Now she'd also drawn something, done something remarkable with the wheels for the car that was stopped. What she did was she retreated the wheels into the cab of the car. So they'd gone up, 
till the little circles for the wheels were touching the baseline for the cab of the car. Now, if the wheels are gone inside, then they're not functioning. They're not taking the car down the road. So the car must be stopped. Now, what can I do with the wheels for the car that has its brakes on? It's going, so it's got to be drawn long, longer than the stopped car. But its brakes are on. What can I do? See, so drew the wheels as quadrilaterals, as having sharp corners, four sharp corners. Now, that wheel would be slewing to a halt. It would bring the, uh, the car to a halt. It could not run smoothly. I mean, it was a simple graphic device invented for something you can't really show. And many blind people have done that. When I've asked them to draw something you can't really show in a picture, they say, all right, uh, what I'm going to do now is, and they draw something special. Uh, like for a wheel that is static, you make the, all the spokes visible. You draw them all in. When the wheel is turning, what you draw is you move the the spokes, uh, turn them into like a little spiral. You turn them into circles in the center. That distinguishes it from the static wheel and suggests it's turning. Oh, a really brilliant thing by Esref was when this, the wheel was static, he drew it as having, uh, as being situated on the ground and he drew a ground line on both sides of the wheel. When the wheel was going, uh, rolling, he drew the ground line only on one side of the wheel. And he also drew a whole lot of little horizontal lines near the top of the wheel to suggest it was moving in a certain direction. Now, these kind of inventive devices for showing all kinds of things, in this case, just movement, uh, blind people have done this frequently in my experience. There is one wonderful woman in, uh, in Germany. She's originally from Japan and she has drawn um, a, a wonderful picture to suggest the sound of a bell, a campanile in Italy, in a, in a piazza. So the bell is swinging, the songs are echoing back and forth in the, in the piazza. And what did she do? She drew a band of lines going to the left and then swinging over to the right and then swinging back again to the left and then swinging back again to the right. And it suggests that the bell, the sound of the bell is swinging back and forth in the piazza. So now she's showing something that isn't visible, let alone like movement across time. It is both auditory and across time, and she's invented a graphic device for suggesting that. Oh, I mean, once you're doing this, you're doing things that sighted people only started doing about 1810. There was an artist in England in 1810 who started drawing the wheels of carts with the spokes fading as they went to the, the, the rim of the wheel and with small ellipses inside the wheel or circles inside the wheel to suggest the movement. Once he had invented that, that kind of device took off like wildfire. It spread to Switzerland, Germany, America, and comic books became full of these graphic devices for suggesting all kinds of things, like a man who's just had an idea and you put an array of lines radiating from his head. Nobody did that mm. before 1810. Nobody showed movement lines before 1810. But blind people, when they are asked to solve the kinds of problems that these comic book devices solve, mm. they invent effective devices similar to these graphic devices that are now rampant throughout the world of comics. Blind people draw in perspective 
like people did in the early Renaissance. They invent perspective for themselves when practicing drawing. And blind people invent graphic devices for all kinds of things, much like sighted people did after 1810. In a way, blind people recapitulate the history of art and are showing and inventing things that sighted people have not yet invented as uh, in solving graphic problems. Yeah, it just goes to show like how creativity often you know, like sprouts out of a challenge and then I mean, how much we can learn from, from people with disabilities. No, no, you're, you're exactly right. What you have to do is have the problem situated, face the problem, invent the problem, and then you can invent the solution. And if blind people say, I'd like to draw such and such. Oh, that's hard to draw. They will invent a device to satisfy themselves, to solve the problem. And that's creative. And that's how creativity comes in, tackling and inventing new problems. John, that's all very fascinating. I have one last question for you. Like as a psychologist, I'm, I'm sure you've, you're interested on in the impact of that has on their well-being like them becoming more able to express themselves and, and 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 so is there any particular studies that quantify that like because i mean it's rather obvious no like i mean that that that's good for their well-being i just wonder if they actually studied the impact on their lives on being able to express themselves through drawing and painting well i, I guess the single most important thing is that many many people in many many schools for the blind in many museums now realize blind people have abilities we never dreamed about and doors are opening left right and center blind people are happy that museums are more open to them than they were that museums are now putting programs in place that um the let's see, the National Federation of the Blind in the United States now makes drawing kits, art making kits, available free to all blind people in the United States. And I expect most countries will follow suit before long. And it is certainly true that just about every major museum in the world, like in Sweden, the National Gallery, uh, like the Louvre in Paris, uh, like the Met in uh, New York, or the National Gallery in Ottawa. Uh, these places now have programs in place. In Taiwan, too, uh, museums are now putting in place programs for the blind. Uh, so in schools, in museums, in galleries, uh, doors are opening. And the blind people that I have met who tell me that they wanted to make art and make pictures when they were children, they, are, they recognize that they had the ability and then that ability was underestimated by people who were their teachers and guides when they were young. Um, there's a certain amount of rethinking going on in every major country in the world that has educational institutions for the blind. And I think it's also occurring in every major institution uh, for art, uh, for the sighted, as they think what we thought was restricted to vision, we now know isn't. It's much more general. And I'm happy to say that uh, many, um, well, surveys of uh, research uh, on blind people and their abilities and institutions for them, those surveys now contain sections in which blind people and art are considered. It's become uh, more and more standard for that to occur. Uh, I think it's wonderful. And I think blind people recognize 
that things are being expected of these institutions that weren't available before. Indeed, that's that's all very fascinating. Uh, John, thank you very much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. And uh, I had no idea that uh, those museums they had and our galleries, they had those programs recommend for the visually impaired. I will encourage our listeners to go to our web page uh, for this particular episode. We're going to list the, the authors that we, we mentioned like through this episode. So you can go and see for yourself how impressive it is, like the art that they do. So John, thank you very much again. And uh, Thank you for all you do and uh, appreciate everything. May I just add one more thing? If people would like to uh, check in to my publications, the single best place to go is ResearchGate uh, and look up John Kennedy there at the University of Toronto. And so my papers are available free there. And I also have a website at the university and you could use that to navigate through to get some information. And I'd be happy also to hear from people if they want to ask some questions and they could write to me at kennedy at utsc.utoronto.ca. So please uh, feel free, look up things and drop me a note we, we're going to add those uh, addresses and different ways to contact you on our page as well thanks for you. thank you john have a good day thanks for having me been a pleasure and that concludes today's episode of the broad eye podcast if you enjoyed this episode please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform of course ratings and reviews are always welcome and you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it thanks for listening